Hallo Erik. Hallo Dörte. Hi there. Well, have you prepared anything for today? Sure. Here's looking at you, kid. What's that supposed to mean? Do you want to play Humphrey Bogart? Look into my eyes, kiddo. Ah, now I get it. Eye, iris, aperture. Exactly. And this is why we're going now to Freiburg. The guys at the Micro-Optics Lab in Freiburg have developed a system which imitates the human iris. It's based on liquids that are encapsulated in a glass chip. So, what's this micro-iris about? Our micro-iris chip consists of fairly complex and tiny structures. See what we have. The green film here is a super thin hydrophobic layer which forces the ink to assume the shape of a ring. You'll see there are microposts in the outer area. These microposts work like a sponge and help us to define a reservoir which absorbs the ink. This requires a little more explanation. I'd suggest we go into the lab and have a look at the real device first. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Philip. How's it going with the chip? Well, this one isn't all that good, but I could show you another one that works really well. Tell me what I'm seeing. Have a look through the microscope. This is the chip that's not working so well. When I switch on the electrode, then you'll see that the liquid contracts. But as you can also see, it doesn't pull the ring smoothly. That's called pinning. The liquid sort of sticks. Ah, yes, I see. Okay. Does this also work optically? Yes, but that I'll have to show you in another lab. Here you see a really good chip. And the three electrodes close and open smoothly as desired. Does it also work if we orient it vertically? Well, yes, but when you use normal oil or water, the ring sags and will get a nice beer belly. Can you prevent that? Yes, we will have to match the density of the liquids, as you can see here. If the density matches, we get a nice homogeneous ring again. We tested quite a number of liquids and oils to get there. That was really a bit of a task. Didn't Moritz say something about the fascinating eyes of the mantis shrimp last time we met? Have you seen a mantis shrimp yet? No. What a colorful creature. And his eyes are so much more beautiful than yours. These eyes also feature slit apertures. With those, the shrimp can differentiate between the tiniest color changes, quite an essential skill in his colorful habitat. And I think this is why Moritz felt that the eyes of the mantis shrimp are a good role model for his research. Moritz, how do we want to reproduce the optical properties of the shrimp's eyes? We're working on a compact camera that provides the spectral information of each pixel of a picture. Unlike the shrimp, we do not use filters, but an optical grating from which red light is diffracted more strongly than blue light. Thus, the two are detected at different positions in the camera. So, where are the similarities? Like the shrimp, our system can only separate the spectral information within a small angle range. To get a complete picture, we must tilt the optics. Here, we see that red and blue are not clearly separated. If I insert a slit aperture, this changes, and we'll see that there was even green hidden underneath the white. Aren't Frederick and Susanna also fascinated by this mantis shrimp? What is it they're after? The mantis shrimp can see things the human eye can't. Frederick and Susanna would like to reproduce the shrimp's optical properties with technical means. They're working on a microscope which will make transparent cells visible. Today we're in Stuttgart with Susanna and Frederick. Susanna, how do you put this into practice? We can use light to switch the polarization state in a spatially varying pattern, but doing this requires a special material, which we get from the University of Potsdam. Together with a diffractive component, our microlasers can generate a polarization pattern whose resolution is variable both in time and space. This shrimp is really special, but it doesn't have an iris stop, does it? 
No, and this is why Tobias from Kaiserslautern sticks with the human eye as the model for his research. Today, Tobias has joined us from Kaiserslautern to explain how the iris stop of our system is working. We would like to refrain from using any movable parts for our iris stop. Instead, we use a special coating of the iris, which can change color. And how does the coating change color? Once we apply a voltage, we can render various segments of the iris transparent. This way, we can control the transmission of light easily. Today, we heard quite a bit about apertures. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we'll tell you how we fabricate all these things.